Well, thank you all. I'm Pam Bradigan from Ohio State University, and I had a question for our Pennsylvania speaker. Um, I wonder how you um, started or began your close collaborations with your librarians and how long that's actually been going on. That's a great question. Um, our center started in July 2006. Um, and so I guess our close collaboration started in August 2006, uh, about a month after we started. How it came about, I actually can't remember. Uh, but I, I do know that uh, both the librarians that we were working with at the time, who actually are no longer at Penn, um, Gretchen, who I, I referenced earlier, is uh, now director of the library at University of Florida, Jacksonville. And Ann Seymour, who is the director of the library at the time, is now at Hopkins. Um, so we're sad that they're both gone. But if any of you know them, they're, uh, they're both uh, extremely gregarious and easy to work with. Uh, and so they may have actually sought us out. It's very possible. But uh, uh, it was easy to. Uh, see a win-win from the start. I had a sort of follow-up question. I'm Holly Bird from the GMR. And that was, um, do you partner with some of the other groups like the NICE and the uh, CATA? Do you ask them what they're doing when you get a question on that? I'm just curious about the partnerships. Yeah, in terms of our rapid reviews, we use um, we have a systematic approach every time a question's asked, and we we tailor it a bit to the to the uh, content of the question. But for most uh, questions that we're answering, we do go to Nice resources, we go to Arc resources, we go to Cadith resources, and if if many of you haven't gone to Nice or Cadith recently, Cadith has. I think over 3,000 rapid reviews that they've done. Um, I actually was just in Vancouver a few weeks ago. The rapid review program that Cadith does celebrated their 10-year their tenth, tenth anniversary. And for those of you who don't know Cadith, I think it stands for Canadian Agency for Drugs and Technology and Healthcare. Um, so it's, it's really a great resource. Um, and um, we do uh, we do have uh, collegial relationships uh, with those organizations as well. I'm Beth Layton at the GMR, and I have a question for Brenda. I was hoping she could talk a little more about the navigators and how you determined that that was uh, a useful thing to do and just ref explain a little further about the education uh, in the program. So early on when we were creating our outreach campaign uh, back in 2012, we were looking to see what type of gaps in informing people that the marketplace was going to be available, uh, how are they going to engage with the marketplace, how would they physically enroll in the marketplace, and we knew we had the call center. Um, back then we didn't have much of the mobile technology that we have now. You, it's now the website is very mobile friendly. Uh, we learned that because we saw the 35 and younger, 25% of them were enrolling or trying to enroll online in the first year, but it was kind of clunky. And now it's much more streamlined. Um, but in creating our outreach campaign, we noticed that for certain populations, it was really going to require someone um, that had access to technology. And if that was going to be an, an issue for that population, how are we going to fill that gap? Um, we knew also in geographically what areas people sometimes don't have access to um, the internet. and how would those people access this website that was going to launch? Um, so in thinking of how, how to meet that need, we thought of libraries. Um, and some of our very smart folks in DC reached out to 
um, our federal partners and said, well, libraries is really uh, someone, it's, it's publicly available, it's open on weekends, they're open late, people know where their library is, and it really just made sense. And so uh, we were able to uh, fine tune that partnership and uh, we're surprised that for the most part, most libraries also agreed that this would really be a great partnership. And it started with the public libraries. Um, and then we worked out with universities um, and then school libraries, uh, some school libraries, some schools are more like a community center as well. Um, so we started reaching out to all different types of libraries. Um, then we also said, well, for people who are able to go to a library, how, how are they going to be able to actually access the website? If, if they don't have internet at home, then they may not be used to navigating websites. Um, they're going to need a different level of assistance. So then through our navigator program, uh, which is funded from the Affordable Care Act to provide in-person assistance, uh, we said, we have this partnership with the library. We knew who our navigators were going to be, and we connected the dots of, we have a commitment from the libraries. They've agreed to stay open, and some had reserved hours for marketplace availability, but we really sometimes want someone there as well to provide assistance. And so the navigators were also able to come into the libraries and say, I'm federally certified to assist people within marketplace. I don't sell insurance. I'm here just to provide a service. And as part of that arrangement, can we provide this formally? And uh, for the most part, it, it, it went very well and it just grew in the second year. Um, so navigators in all of our states, uh, some states have more than others because they also receive state funding in some states that decided to accept the federal funding. In other states, it is only the federally funded navigators that are providing that level of assistance. But in almost every single one of our states, it is a really nice working partnership between the navigators and the libraries. Hi, I, I can speak up pretty loud. Uh, my name's Ann Watson, and I just kind of have a follow-up question, um, and it relates to um, what Eric was talking about, about um, the lack of health literacy of many individuals and the Affordable Care Act. Um, I, I agree the first year it was extremely clunky. I tried to help my daughter um, sign up for it, and I'm... A, fairly literate person and it was very difficult so what I, I took out of that experience at that time was if I am a new um, a citizen of the US and I come from Somalia and I my English is very poor um, how am I ever going to figure this out um, so going off on that I'm really glad to hear that and, and I know that they, you all worked with the public libraries. Are the navigators and the arrangements with the public libraries um, to assist individuals who have a low or uh, low level of health literacy, um, are, is that still taking place at each enrollment cycle? And what about the people um, who are trying to sign up for health care um, for the special enrollment periods, is there support out there for that now? So that really uh, is different in each state. So for example, in Illinois, Illinois is a partnership state, so they are funded to do their own outreach. And so they have additional grantees, over a thousand of them, um, in a variety of locales. They have them inside banks and churches and community centers in their own uh, free clinics. Uh, community centers, um, a lot in ethnic neighborhoods specifically funded by an organization that was already in that neighborhood. So Illinois is a little different than most states. Um, and that partnership will continue throughout the summer. Um, right now there is no set funding for navigators in year three. Uh, that's been the norm since day one though. Uh, so we didn't know if we were going to have funding for navigators in year two until about a week before the grant application came out. We didn't know if we were going to have navigators in year one. So as of now, we don't know if there will be funding for navigators in year three. 
um, for the next enrollment season that starts um, in November. Um, in some states, they chose to not receive federal funds for outreach. Uh, so <laughs> in our border states, Wisconsin, Michigan, Ohio, and Indiana, the only people doing outreach are the federal navigators. And we're talking about $2 million per state um, in comparison to Minnesota and Illinois, which almost had more than $25, $28 million for outreach. What you can do with that type of level of funding is you really are able to fund a variety of partners that work and live in the community specific to that language and do a fantastic job. In other states that are only dealing with about $2 million of outreach, it's a much more scaled down version. And even to go to one language like Spanish is, is a stretch. This is Beth again. I know that after the, during the break that all of you were discussing things and, and I got to hear a little of it, but I, I really, I think everybody would be interested in where you all see intersections in uh, the information needs and, and what kind of discussions you were having at, at the break. I, I really, uh, Eric and I were, were talking after his presentation and, and he was uh, he was saying, you know, if I knew you were going to be here, you know, I, I, I may have readjusted my comments slightly. <laughs> Speak, <laughs> um, but uh, but I guess one comment I'd make is I think everything that that you were sharing uh, really resonated well with me, um, and part of this is you know how dogmatic is somebody of applying evidence uh, if. <coughs> One of the uh, slides that Eric presented and, and that I often present, I think it's a great slide, is that Venn diagram where you have evidence and then you have uh, patient and provider values and preferences. And then usually you have that third circle, which is resources available, whether it's insurance or specialists or technology. And really, evidence-based medicine is the intersection of those three circles. It's, it's not just the evidence, because you can't, you can't practice evidence-based medicine by just applying science done from a set of trials and completely different patients to, to your patient. I mean, you have to take patient preferences into account. You have to take... Um, you know, both the risks and harms uh, resulting from, from that intervention into account. Um, uh, you have to take the resources available into account for good or for bad. Um, so I, I guess, you know, my one take home would be the comment I made when I started, um, it was at some level in jest, but it was also true in that I think when you think about what the alternatives are to evidence-based medicine, evidence-based medicine starts to look better and better. Um, and there's a, there's a, a, a tongue-in-cheek paper that was published in the BMJ. I don't know how many of you have, have seen the BMJ's Christmas issue every year, uh, their holiday issue, but uh, uh, this was a paper in one of those holiday issues, and many of these studies are, are tongue-in-cheek. And this paper was about the, all, the seven alternatives to evidence-based medicine. And they had a lot of great alternatives in there, which were tongue-in-cheek, but were very much true. You know, things like eminence-based medicine, where, you know, providers practice what they're told to practice by somebody with gray hair. I mean, that's, that's a reality of medicine, whether that practice is, you know, harmful or helpful. 
you do it because somebody older than you tells you to do it. Or um, uh, confidence-based medicine, <laughs> uh, which often applies to surgeons. Uh, so so there, there are all these different types of, of medicine out there. But to, if they're evidence-based medicine, if, if you don't apply it in a dogmatic way, I think the best way to think about it is if there's research evidence that is relevant to the question at hand, then it should be it should be considered in the decision making. It may not make the decision, but it, it should be considered. Thank you very much. I'm from downstate and I'm a little out of touch because my current project is reading old medical staff meetings from the 40s and the 50s. So my question is, with this new act and the sign up, first of all, how many people are still choosing, for whatever reason, not to sign up? And secondly, there's so much political noise that I can't tell how health systems and hospitals feel about this. Is it making a difference, or do we still have reams of people using the ER as primary care? Well, it actually happens that I'm an ER physician also. Um, my, uh, my name is Rob Furno. I'm the new chief medical officer for Region 5 for CMS, and I'm actually a practicing emergency medicine physician. I actually graduated from um, UIC from their School of Public Health also, and then I also have a business degree from uh, Kellogg. And so it's uh, interesting that when they recruited me, it was an interesting combination of all these things. And um, what, when, when you're addressing um, how many are still uninsured, there's still over 30 million that are uninsured. And it will be interesting to see with uh, 2014's taxes uh, what is going to come with all the fees. And uh, I know a lot of our special enrollment people are really getting a lot of calls related to, I didn't know I was going to get a fee on this. And uh, how do I fill out this form? And why do I have a form for each of my families? We don't all file taxes. Um, so I think we will be seeing a lot of that as it comes forward. Uh, with the emergency department, uh, I know a lot of the ER community was like, well, it's great. We'll actually get insured people who come to the emergency department. Uh, but a, no a large number of what we do uh, of work in the emergency department is for the very uninformed and the very medically illiterate. And uh, I, I found in my practice that a lot of the patient-centered things aren't, aren't just possible to do in the emergency department because there's such a huge barrier um, for medical literacy. And uh, then you, you stack on top of that the situation and the uh, circumstances that you come to the emergency department. Uh, we're still seeing large numbers of uninsured in the emergency departments, uh, especially in urban emergency departments, of course. And uh, there's still uh, still reports are coming out on how much is actually mis misuse of the emergency department. Uh, one of the handouts that uh, uh, that put out for CMS is really trying to educate people on what is appropriate use of emergency departments versus primary care. And that's one of the education things is how so that people are aware of what is um, what is going to be more beneficial for them. Not saying also the negatives, but also the positives of the differentiation. Kind of a long explanation to that. I would I would add that um <clears throat> there's there's no amount of insurance that's going to teach people how to consume care and what i've been i've had a relationship with with medicine my whole life and it's been consistent my parents took me to the pediatrician i remember dr witten um he was a good guy he was my doctor until i was 18 and it's it's I've had a dickens at a time trying to find another good one since that's really really been difficult but if people aren't inculcated with the values of how to consume care and let's face it we're in a consumer model we don't need to debate whether healthcare is now a commodity when we regularly refer to patients as consumers People don't know how to consume the care. They don't, first of all, have trusting relationships with clinicians that, that they feel that they have a rapport with, that there's an open line of communication. And they also don't know what to do when there is a problem or 
what a symptom is or what to do when you have symptoms of something. If I have a, a runny nose, I get a box of tissues. Other people may report to an ER and they don't know what to do because they don't have that longevity. And that's going to take some education. The quick comment that uh, our senior uh, executive leadership of our health system, uh, I, I think, uh, were very supportive of the Accountable Care Act um, because it's this issue of, you know, our health care provider organization is is paying for the care of patients who come, whether they have insurance or not. Uh, so, you know, having people uh, be insured when they're seeking care um, is clearly beneficial to, to the healthcare provider organization. You know, in that, in that same way, we're, we're in the state of Pennsylvania where uh, our previous governor, who did not get reelected for a number of reasons, one of those reasons may have been. Um, you know, the ACA became very much a political football, and it wasn't, you know, is this something that could provide a benefit to my constituents, my state? You know, um, and so as, as you were describing, I, I think uh, the state made decisions not to, um, not to accept federal funding um, early on, and, and that may have had an impact. Um, but that decision has been reversed recently with a with a, a new election. We also just received our latest enrollment numbers. I think just last week or this week. So we've seen across the board nationwide uh, the enrollment of people under age 35. Ironically, is only 35 percent of enrollment. So. 65% of people who enrolled in the marketplace this last year are over the age of 35. After 35, you start valuing healthcare differently. You're off in a different place in your life. You may be more stable and you have kids. You also may have more, more disposable income. On the flip side, people under 35 um, maybe don't want to spare an extra $150 a month even after their premium subsidy because that $150 is currently right now going to something else that they value more than healthcare. They don't go to the doctor. They haven't been to the doctor since they left their home at 18 possibly. So it's, it's both a different mentality of how they manage healthcare and also uh, like Dr. Ferno said, they aren't used to paying the fee. Once they start paying the fee, it was only 95% this, this year. It doubles, to the, uh, doubles that next year and it triples again uh, to over 3% of your income in 2016 and higher. So it's, uh, it's going to be hopefully a more growing incentive for people to say, well, I'm not paying for insurance, but I have to pay the fee. Hi, um, I'm Maureen Clark. I'm here at the University of Illinois. <clears throat> so I had a question in terms of what kind of uh, data is being kept by uh, the enactors of the ACA um, in terms of, say, patients going to emergency rooms. Um, one of the criticisms that I've heard is that, is that people wind up going to emergency rooms because they may be in an insurance situation where they're moved down the line or they're not seen rapidly by their primary care uh, physician, and so they wind up not having easy access to primary primary care, and so going into an emergency room for that reason. Um, another question I have is really in relationship to what you just said about people who may be registered in the health um, uh, system, but they don't have the money for a deductible, or they don't have the money, you know, to to pay out front. And so I'm kind of wondering as this thing gets unfolded. Um, and we're looking at why, so people may be registered, but they're not accessing the system. How is that being tracked? Uh, so the marketplace itself, for the federal marketplace, the federal government is not offering insurance. It's all through private health insurance companies. So the private health insurance companies may be reporting, you know, 
overall what utilization rates are for you know their patient pool but the federal government doesn't have any specific claims data for John Smith because we're not processing those claims it's always at the private health insurance plan level um, that being said we do are we're, we're looking at the data trends of who's going to the ER who, what kind of primary care physicians are in the network um, and as we're going into year three, we're also making sure that the contracts and oversight of those plans are addressing the provider network issues. Um, we saw an opportunity for improvement from year one to year two, so we specifically made that one of the criteria that we needed to verify the providers, not only for uh, specialty care, but how many primary care physicians were within a certain mile radius for the people that were supposed to be uh, marketed to for the specific plan. And so we saw vast improvement in provider networks um, in those plans that were offered in year two, year two compared to year one. Um, Going into year three, we, we haven't even started seeing what plans look like, of course, but we've seen drastic difference and the trend is you're having more insurers come into the marketplace, so that's more competition. Premiums are continuing to uh, either stay pretty well the same, um, not very much growth in the premiums, um, and the benefits are uh, smaller deductibles than year one. Um, and more options for plans with reduced deductibles instead of that maximum deductible, which was over $6,000 in year one. So that's definitely something that we are encouraged to see because the plans are recognizing this is more of a stable model that we want to participate in. Thank you. And is that data that you're looking at available publicly? Uh, what type of health care the marketplace? Just looking at the are, networks and what the issues are with the networks, what well, you just discussed. Is that mm -hmm. available? Yeah, that's right. You, you can see the network of all of the plans right at healthcare.gov. So as you look at each plan and you look at the details page, then you can search for a physician individually or you can see what provider networks they're in. So that's available now. I was just going to add that it sounds like the state of Illinois has made the investment to um, really change kind of the health literacy landscape by um, investing funds and, and really getting out into the community and educating people. And if, um, if there's been any thought to um, coming up with some best practices, um, and I wonder if states that didn't take federal funding to um, make the changes really kind of needed to make this successful in their states, if they have looked to the state of Illinois or other states that have been more successful um, as role models or as a place to, you know, make some changes, hopefully, in the future. <laughs> I'd like to make an observation on that, uh, based on something that Craig said, which was uh, the politicization issue. Some states have a what they feel is a vested interest in seeing it fail. They don't want it to be successful in their state. They're, it's a political interest and not a constituent interest. They want to get reelected. They want to get more money for the coffers so they can get reelected. And so certain interests then may, may trump in the decision making. And, and that's it. I don't know. Up to, I think we're up to repeal number 20 something in, in Congress for uh, the law. 40, 40, excuse me. Uh, so I, they're, they're slowing down, and the rhetoric um, is not, uh, we're not hearing it quite as much, but um, that could be. be just because I'm not around the, you know, the halls of, of Congress and the media outlets are not reporting it anymore, uh, but it may still very well be going on and we'll see what happens in the, in the next elections. You know, we have some entitlements and then other entitlements we're not entitled to. Ditto. <laughs> what, we, what we do, what we are encouraged is that we are seeing many more states that were uh, hesitant to take federal funding for a variety of reasons are now willing to expand Medicaid. So about half of our states decided not to expand Medicaid and 
uh, when some of those states changed their minds, uh, we thought hell had frozen over, um, but they did. And so we ourselves are highly encouraged by the number of states that are now willing to expand Medicaid. Uh, the federal government is covering, you know, through the 2020, more than 90% of the reimbursement for those costs anyway. Um, so now Ohio, Michigan, uh, Wisconsin to some degree, and Indiana will say it's expanded Medicaid. So all of our Midwest states um, have expanded, and that was not the case just a year ago. We saw a similar phenomenon with stimulus, where some states refused the money initially and then saw neighboring states having new roads, having jobs, and then they took the money. And so it's especially difficult because the statute specifies that you need to be over 100% of the federal poverty level to qualify for the tax credits. And in states that do not expand Medicaid, that means people who are under 100% federal poverty level still don't have access to any type of insurance. They don't qualify for Medicaid because the state decided not to expand Medicaid. And the marketplace cannot offer them tax credits because the statute, uh, when it was originally written, uh, thought that all states were going to expand Medicaid, and so it excluded that population purposefully, thinking states were going to expand. Um, that changed after the first Supreme Court law decision. So now that more states are expanding, uh, that means that that population is now, for the first time, access to health insurance um, because they, they wanted to have tax credits, but we specifically could not offer them to under 100% federal poverty level. Thank you. Any other questions? Well, I, I had one more. Um, I think I sound better without this, but um, so there's a, a SMART uh, rule that was put in. I don't know if I'm referring to it correctly, but it had to do with uh, Medicaid patients. And um, I became aware of it in the sense of uh, children receiving more than four medications would have to have prior approval. And um, are, are you aware of that? Yeah, so I, I was wondering if anybody is tracking the effect of that, because I have talked to people who are concerned. You know, when, when you're a little kid and you have four medications, you're usually pretty sick. And often, uh, you know, this is a group that's uh, already disadvantaged in terms of time, energy, health, literacy to uh, advocate for themselves. So I, I guess I have a concern about what's going on with that particular legislation and, you know, uh, what's happening with the kids that are uh, bound by it. If that seems great. Uh, I'm only vaguely familiar of that issue. Um, I've heard that only at meetings that I've also attended, um, contrary to the name Centers for Medicare and Medicaid Services. We don't really do much with Medicaid. The state does that. And then uh, we approve any changes and, of course, fund half of the program. But it's really administered at the state level. Um, so I know that the advocates are quite vocal about that issue because I've heard it you know, just secondhand. Um, but I personally don't know who's setting the issue, just because I'm just not familiar with the issue enough to say either way. I'm sure someone is, considering the many child care and health care advocates that we have here in Illinois, Campaign for Better Health Care, Access Living, Health and Disability Advocates. Uh, those are, I've heard that issue from them repeatedly. Uh, before we go further, because some people are trying to leave, if you, uh, on every table, there is a uh, evaluation form. Uh, at the back, I have uh, certificates. If you need an MLACE certificate or need a certificate for any other purpose to verify that you were here today, uh, go ahead and fill out that form, and I'll meet you at the back table. Would you all like to make any other comments before uh, we wrap this up? I feel like I should give you the last word, whatever uh, you would like it to be. I'm not as cynical as I may appear to be. <laughs> <laughs> I'm actually quite hopeful because uh, I, think, I think 
clinicians are good. Physicians are good, but they're getting juiced in a system that they have very little control over. And um, you know, back in the in the bad old days of paternalism, things were more of a, a dyad, and physicians wielded a lot of control. And and now physicians really they they don't have a lot of control um, in the instrumentalities uh, that they get to use. Um, Sometimes you know, they do surgeons certainly more than primary docs, um, but there, there's, there's a lot of very good people out there. But um, the choices are are limited, and control is not what it used to be. Um, are any of you very concerned about the current state of medicine transition uh, going from practitioners and healers to business managers? and the effect that's going to have on training future healthcare practitioners because their roles have really changed radically now in this climate. I don't think you got picked up on me. I apologize. So um, I was wondering um, if you had any thoughts or if you could shed any light on the clinicians going from typically practitioners to now business managers in that role. I think since the um, healthcare climate in terms of insurance management um, and healthcare reform is also impacting this. How is that impacting what you feel? Um, we know that there's a burnout crisis for physicians in the United States. What do you What are your thoughts about that? Yeah, boy, that's a, that's a really tough question. I think that's a whole probably whole degree. Forget like a a, a week long conference. But um, what I would say is, and this is how I make myself feel better every day. This is all an evolution. I think there were a lot of good things about uh, medical practice in the past, but there were also a lot of major limitations and harmful things about medical practice in the past too. And I think medicine is clearly an evolution and where we're at right now is, is not the end of that evolution. I think, I'm not even sure if it's in the middle, but you know, we're, we're still at some level in the, in the dark ages and uh, there's light to come, whether it's in decades or a hundred years or well past our, you know, our lifetimes, not to get too, too, uh, too depressing. But I will say that there, there are a number of positives that have occurred, I would say even in the, in the um, last number of years. The, the idea about patient-centered outcomes and patient-centeredness I think at least in academic medicine um, has really taken hold. Uh, and the, the idea of the importance of quality and safety outcomes and the value of care that's being provided, these are concepts that are really taking hold. Um, much because there are uh, external incentives, uh, whether it's research funding from the Patient-Centered Outcomes Research Institute, or whether it's pay for performance from CMS or other regional commercial payers. Um, so these are all transforming the ways that people think. And um, you know, sometimes they seem superficial, but, but some of these changes are, are really radical changes. The whole idea of shared decision making you know, is, is being taught in our medical school now. I don't think it was taught a decade ago. Um, so I, I think there are many changes that are occurring, um, and there are positive changes. But yes, um, you know, I, I very much do believe in the notion of the, you know, the the medical industrial complex as well as as you were describing earlier. Uh, and so, at, at some level, that that puts the onus on us to uh, to be good consumers of healthcare and know when we need it and when we don't, and and you know how to. Uh, uh, how do we get, how do we get what we need from from uh, the providers who can help us? There there have been a number of uh, clinicians of, of various sorts in my family. <clears throat> I became an attorney. I was a big disappointment. Uh, I, I can tell you, and they would agree that because of the lack of training, they were terrible business people. And so my father was a doc, my brother's a dentist. 
<laughs> uncles, cousins, docs, surgeons. Um, but my father and brother were in private practice. My dad had a terrible time uh, for, for a long time. He, he wasn't able to manage the business end of things, which led to human resources problems. It led to bankruptcy problems, real estate problems, all different kinds of problems because he didn't have the training in there. He was a great doc. I mean, imagine, a doc. I mean, he, he, he practiced, I, I don't know how long, he never got sued for malpractice. I just, I'd never have met another doctor. He practiced for 50 plus years. He never got sued for malpractice. I'm sure he settled out a couple of claims, <laughs> but he never actually, he, he'd never spent a day in court. He, he had very good relationships in his community and was well thought of in his community, but he couldn't run a business. And and so I, I don't have a problem with with physicians doing that for reasons, as you said, right away from from burnout. There there are lots of different ways to practice medicine, and you know the the business ethic <clears throat> does not have to. <clears throat> we could still fulfill the clinical needs and business needs at the same time. The the problem comes when. The, the interests are, are disparate and when profitability comes at the expense of good clinical care. Uh, as long as things like that are not happening, um, some, someone nefariously in the back room making money while people are dying, it's, I, I just don't see what the problem of that is. It's, it's, it's a recognition of the system and the society that, that we are in. We are thoroughly entrenched in a capitalist system and it, it takes its place in all aspects of our society. And, and clinicians, just like the rest of us, have to figure out how to manage their affairs in there. Because if, if they're not good at business, <coughs> then there's no way that they can treat people. If they have to close doors, then they can't treat people. And so there, there has to be an effective way for them to manage business affairs. So I'm actually probably considered one of those hybrid doctors who gone on to business school and different things like that. And uh, for me, it, it really is a, a question of, um, in the past, hospitals uh, were very much the administration and the physicians. And they didn't cooperate at all. And they were very much put against each other. I think uh, in the 80s and 90s, one of the big things that hospital systems started doing was uh, lean principles and Six Sigma. And most people don't realize, but lean principles are from Toyota. Um, so they were starting to adopt manufacturing to hospital systems. And so what we, what's we what been exciting to see is that physicians who can uh, understand business are deciding to start branching out into that. And now you are seeing chief transformation officers, chief medical officers moving into the CEO types of positions to really start guiding healthcare with the inevitability of that it is a business, especially in the United States. And if there was still complete separation, we would have even more and more problems. So for me, it, it's, um, I, I'm, I've been I've been practiced for 15 years, full time, and have been able to make that transition. And for me, it was more of a challenge issue. Uh, some people say, oh, you must have burned out. You worked nights for five years in an uh, urban emergency department. I'm like, yes, but, you know, this is giving me a totally new avenue to, you know, uh, be challenged and be helpful. And for me, really address things on a more macro level rather than just on a, that dyadic relationship. So for me, I think it's actually promising uh, that there has been some translation and there has been some indexing to allow for uh, leaders to be able to have that clinical knowledge. I would much prefer my CEO have a medical degree than just a business degree, <laughs> because then I'd be sure that that person had some kind of ethics training. Hey, wow, look at that. <laughs> <laughs> Please join in the other day that you're